Okay. Welcome everybody who is joining this uh, hangout organized by the Jobs Knowledge Platform. Welcome to our panelists. I will be introducing them shortly. I'm David Robalino. I'm a lead economist here at the World Bank and also with the Jobs Knowledge Platform. And what, we work, what we're going to do today is to have a conversation about this book that has been published recently by three colleagues at ADB. The name of the book, I don't know if you see it there, is Mejores Pensiones, Mejores Trabajos, Better Pensions, Better Jobs. Welcome everybody. Are Mariano Bosch, organized by the Jobs Knowledge Platform, and Carmen Pages. I think, it's a, I think it's a great contribution to the debate on pension reform, not only like the economy, uh, and also with the Jobs Knowledge Platform. Very interesting we'll proposal. We'll to address some of the problems facing pension systems in Latin America in terms of coverage, in terms of financial sustainability, but also potential distortions that they create in labor markets, for instance, by reducing formal employment. So today we have the pleasure to have with us three great panelists. We have one of the authors, Mariano Bosch, who is connecting from the IDB. Joining us from Uruguay is Álvaro Forteza. He's a professor of economics at the University of Republic of Uruguay, one of the experts on social insurance that we have here in the region. And then Robert Palacios, who's also a lead economist at the World Bank. He is very well known for his work on pensions at international level. And his current job is as the head of the pensions team at the World Bank. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to be doing is ask them individual questions. But we want to keep this formal, meaning if any of them has reaction, comments on the answers uh, of the others, please feel free, feel free to do so. so. I want to start with you, Mariano, the obvious question. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? What do you think are the main messages, the two, three things that you would like people to remember? Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for the um, for this space, for this possibility to talk about the the book. We thank the Jobs Knowledge Platform for for the opportunity. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the book. Um, I think what we try to do in the book is essentially four things. One, we try to give and to give an overview of what is the current pension coverage situation in, in the region, in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Then we try to understand why the situation is the way it is, uh, essentially with a relatively low coverage um, area. Then we go into analyzing what are the experiences that we have seen in the last, let's say, two decades uh, regarding pension coverage. and. And we analyze it and try to extract some, some lessons. And the final thing that we do is try to give a proposal on what we think from the IDB should be the main lines uh, to inform a pension reform. So the main messages that we, we get in the book are, are the following. I mean, just let me give you a couple of numbers to, to frame the, the issue. What we see today in the region is only four out of ten uh, uh, pensioners. Sorry, they're calling me. Uh, only four out of ten uh, uh, people over the age uh, 65, they have what we call a contributory pension. That is, they save for their own pension uh, in the past. Um, so that's that's pretty that's pretty low. Uh, what we also see is that an extra 20% have managed to obtain a pension through what we call a non-contributory pension, um, social assistance pensions, um, social pensions as, as the World Bank uh, calls them. So in total we have like around 60% of people over 65 that have today um, a pension. So there is a gap of 40% of, of the people that don't have a pension. But what really worries us is the future. Um, we see that only four out of ten workers are contributing for a pension today. Four out of ten workers are formal today. Uh, so that leaves 
that with the demographic transition that we're going to observe in the next few decades in the region, we we think that around, let's say, from 60 to 80 million people over 65 in, in, in four decades will not be covered by a pension. Uh, they, they wouldn't have no say for, for a pension. Um, so that is that is really a concern. So what we try to do in, in the book is try to understand why this is like that and essentially the main message that we that we try to give is that the incentives that are constructed around the social protection system are tilting workers and firms to to work informally to operate informally and that is impacting the the pension systems in a way that give us this this low coverage and hence the need for this development of non-contributory pensions or, or social pensions. So then we, we draw from the experiences in the region of what have we learned in the last two decades of this implementation of, of non-contributory pensions, uh, uh, the, the different experiences of trying to increase coverage by creating more formal jobs, and we can talk a little bit about those uh, in the conversation and what, what have we learned from that. But I think the, the main message for us, apart from the fact that you know the, the situation is like it is and, and trying to provide these conceptual frameworks, but that we try to provide an avenue for reform. And, and here there are two essential messages. I think we should, we should try to aim for universal coverage. I think that should be uh, a name of, of the reforms. And, and if, if universal coverage is, is an objective, we see no other uh, instrument than providing a kind of social per pension. And how the social pension is, or non-contributory pension is, is designed is very important. So for us, we give three kind of indications what a, a good social pension would be for us. First, we think it should be universal. Second, we think it should be anti-poverty, uh, so relatively low and inflation adjusted, so it's fiscally sustainable in the future, and it should be efficient, it should not distort the incentives to save in the future. But the second main message that we want to give in the book is that, okay, it's fine, we should, we should develop the social pensions, design them well, but also we should increase formal jobs today. We should definitely have an impact on the number of people that are contributing today for for a pension, uh, for a pension system, and for that, you know, we have a, a number of tools. Uh, in the book, we talk about subsidies. In the book, we talk about more monitoring on the labor market. Uh, institutions, particular institutions like minimum wages, like other regulations, and you know, the new wave of behavioral economics that tell us about how we can design well the incentives and and how people see the decisions. So it's is more it's easier for them to save. But the, the main message is universal coverage, yes, social pensions, I think is probably the only tool. We have to design them well. And on the other side, we definitely have to increase the number of formal jobs today. And for that, I think I think we'll all agree on that is there is a, an, an objective. What are the particular instruments that leads us to that objective? I think that's more a question of debate. And then we, we propose some in, in the book. But that's that's more or less the, the main message is that that we tried to convey in this publication. Thank you, thank you very much, Mariano. Alvaro, let's uh, let's move to you. Again, thanks for joining us uh, from Uruguay. Why don't you tell us what are your reactions, the comments that you have on the book, the things that you like uh, about the book, ideas you agree with, but also the things that you like less or issues where you are not in agreement. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to on you in this, uh, in this informal meeting uh, with the, 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 the web. Uh, and I, I want to first uh, congratulate Mariano and the whole team of the labor market and the security team of the, of the IDB for this excellent report. Uh, there are two aspects in the report I, I, I like. Um, and I think uh, are make it very uh, useful, interesting, especially for policymakers. One is uh, that uh, I think you manage to, to cast a, a good balance between two difficult things here. One which I, 
I would call specificity and the other one flexibility. In, in which sense? In the sense that in order to have something that uh, is, is useful, uh, something useful in terms of uh, policy making, uh, you, ne you need to be uh, specific. You need to propose something concrete. But at the same time, we know that the region is very diverse. So we have many different situations, and we don't, we cannot provide just a very simple recipe for everybody. So this is, I think, always a challenge in this, in this type of reports. And uh, from my point of view, this report uh, crafted a, a very good balance between these two things. Uh, so this is one strength I see in a very general sense in the report. The other point also related to the, the proposal is that uh, I think it's nice that uh, you provide uh, an, uh, an estimation, even if probably a rough estimation, but an estimation of, uh, finally, of the cost of the reform, to show to suggest that uh, this reform is doable. Of course, uh, I have not reproduced uh, the computations, but uh, I appreciate the effort uh, in showing at least the orders of magnitude of uh, a, a reform, a proposal that could look, in principle, uh, pretty ambitious, because talking about universal pension coverage in Latin America is, of course, a, a challenge. So I think there are here two strong points in the, in the report. Um, as Mariano already mentioned, the, uh, the report emphasizes, or, or I, I mean the, the, the point of departure of the report is uh, incomplete progress. So uh, one main concern all over the report, you see, is uh, that what to do to expand progress. Uh, and there is a very concrete proposal, uh, one with, with say, I will say two, two points. One is uh, universal non-contributory pensions, uh, specifically here to uh, reducing poverty in old age. The other point in the proposal is strengthening uh, contributory pensions, uh, and basically oriented to the another uh, important goal of the system, which is consensus move. Um, I think that uh, this report makes very uh, clear options in, in some topics that have been uh, controversial. Uh, one is this endorsement of non contributory pensions. Uh, well, it, uh, th this point is probably less controversial nowadays than it used to be uh, some years ago because, uh, in a sense, it's similar to the zero pillar World Bank proposal or to the, uh, the protection floor, the basic protection floor of the ILO. So, in, in this sense, I think the, this proposal of the IDB is well in line with what other organizations in the field have been proposing. No? Um, but you also propose that the social uh, pensions be universal uh, rather than target and provide a series of reasons, basically efficiency reasons, uh, incentives reasons, why you uh, prefer to make the, 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 the social pension universal. And this is uh, a point in which there is still controversy. Uh, then uh, the contributory pensions remain as a key component in, in your proposal uh, and is especially uh, oriented to this goal of consensus movement. Um, you also endorse contributory con uh, contribution subsidies, uh, like matching contributions and the like. Uh, I think in this, at least three points I have mentioned, you, you have made some uh, very concrete uh, options in, in terms that are still uh, controversial. Um, I will say that the report does not touch some other uh, controversial issues in, in the region, and you say explicitly that you are going to abstain, that you are not discussing in detail uh, in the report uh, some things that, uh, that are important in terms of the design of the system, in terms, for instance, whether you choose uh, defined benefits or defined contribution uh, schemes, or whether you prefer to use pay as you go or funded schemes, the degree of actuarial fairness of the schemes, these type of things. Um, 
I understand that uh, you don't have to speak about everything or to, to make uh, strong uh, statements about everything, all the points that are controversial and are uh, discussed in the, in, the, in the social security policies. But here there are, of course, some, uh, some topics that at least some of our countries have to deal with. Uh, well, I mean, all our countries have to deal with and we need some uh, guidance uh, in this in this question. Um, other other important issues related to this uh, to your proposal and things that I don't see so much discussed in the, in the proposal are uh, redistribution, intra-generational and, and intergenerational redistribution, and. Uh, some aspects of this proposal would be uh, controversial in terms of the impact they have in terms of redistribution. Uh, specifically in a country like mine, there are some pressing issues in terms of sustainability, in terms of the opportunity of some parametric reforms that must be done, for instance, in terms of uh, minimum pension age, uh, things like that that well, are not discussed uh, in depth in the report. And as I said before, I'm not claiming that all the reports should touch all the topics. It's impossible. And I think it's perfectly right that it chose to uh, emphasize some topics that are indeed extremely relevant. I'm just, uh, I just want to point out that, especially for some countries like mine, there are some pressing issues that uh, should also be uh, analyzed. For instance, when you discuss uh, institutions, something that I, I really like, uh, well, one very important point, I think, is which institutional design helps us deal with this tendency we have in social security systems to procrastinate, okay? So to, to take decisions uh, later, uh, not to do some unpleasant reforms when they uh, should be uh, done. Okay? Uh, but well, overall, I think that the report is uh, very uh, useful, very interesting. I think it will help to deliberate uh, about reform in the, in the region. In the region. Okay? Thank, so you. For the time Thank you, Alvaro. We're going to go back to this issue of the potential regressivity of some of the proposals. But let me follow up on something that you mentioned that the report doesn't take a position about whether the system should be defined benefit, defined contribution, pay as you go funded. I understand the report says that what is important is to have actuarially fair formulas with the make sure that the systems are sustainable and improve incentives. But Mariano, would you like to react on that? Sure. Um, yeah, and we, we actually um, before writing the report, we had an initial discussion whether we should get into into this debate, and and we agreed that you know it had been uh, a, a matter of substantial debate back in the 90s and and in the early 2000s, and uh, what we observe is that at the end of the day, the the focus of this report was going to be you know re regardless of the system that we observe, the, one of the main uh, the most important things that people contribute to the system. So you may have Defined benefit and, and or defined contribution, which have very different implications for for insurance, for redistribution, as you well pointed out. But at the end of the day, they will not provide coverage unless you know people contribute to them. And and I've, we follow that route. And obviously, uh, we we found that if we were going to get into that debate, uh, we're going to get lost. Like and, and it has become very dogmatic in the region as well to to try to disentangle. Uh, whether you know we think the fine benefit or the fine contribution should better suit the, the region, so we don't get into that, and so that that was kind of like the, the short answer to, to that reaction. And yeah, and, and we agree. I mean, there, there are things that we cannot, we didn't touch uh, in depth, like issues like redistribution. Although I'm pretty sure that with David we're going to talk about, a little bit about that in, in some of the in the in the proposals, and. Um, and yeah, I mean that's that's my my first reaction that you know we we tried to nail down one particular issue that we thought it was important for the region, and we we thought it had been less discussed than than other issues. 
this this issue that you know what happens in the labor market it's extremely important for for the pension uh, schemes and we Carmen and I in particular are mostly labor economists we saw it from from, from that perspective and that's how we somehow frame the the discussion mm -hmm. thank you Mariano Robert yeah, so tell us again the same question what are your reactions what do you think about the book absolutely so yeah I, I also have the same reaction uh, as Alvaro that uh, I want to congratulate Mariano and the team at the IDB and his colleagues uh, for producing this this book um, which I think is important not only for the Latin American discussion but globally um, and I look forward to uh, seeing the English version uh, I think it's, it's coming up. That, it's coming up. <laughs> I think it's something that's really we're going to disseminate ourselves and help you uh, spread spread this uh, book around because I think it really uh, raises some some very interesting issues, but also uh, makes a bold proposal that is empirically based, which is a great starting point for for any debate. So let me give you a, a few of my reactions. First, I I think uh, the book works off of uh, what I think are three principles. One is to separate the redistribution from the consumption smoothing objectives of, of a pension system, which all pension systems have. And related to that is, these, is the financing of that redistribution from general revenues, which I think is an important thing as well. And thirdly, the idea of financial sustainability. And this actuarial relationship is sort of assumed, and I'll come back to that. I think it was wise not to get into that debate but there's one aspect of that debate that I want to come back to that I don't think you uh, can really avoid in this discussion, uh, which has to do with financing. But those three principles, uh, which, by, by the way, I think are very consistent with what we wrote in 1994 in averting the old age crisis, um, I think have several benefits if you follow them through. One is that by delinking uh, minimum old age income security uh, from the payroll tax finance system you can get the universal coverage you're looking for and not rely on a payroll tax which has several uh, downsides. Uh, related to that your, your emphasis on trying to shift away from payroll tax financing the dependence on payroll tax financing um, including with the government's contribution on the subsidy is really encourages formalization so I think that's that's another uh, a positive and also this actuarial relationship for ensuring sustainability so I think the the principles uh, are clear to me and, and I agree with them and it, it does produce uh, certain benefits if you if you do them I think we don't disagree on those things it's but I do have some some areas where I think how you design the system uh, to follow through with those principles may be different. Your proposal has got two big prongs, and I won't address uh, some of the institutional and, 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 and other areas with the labor market that you were talking about. But the two main prongs to me that I wanted to focus on were, again, as Alvaro said, the non-contributory or social pension, the universal social pension, um, and, of course, uh, the, the, this government uh, subsidization of the of the contribution uh, for, for workers in the, in the scheme itself. Um, you address, you use the terminology which I also use, one is an ex post subsidy and the other is an ex ante type subsidy. Mm -hmm. So let me start with the ex post subsidy, the social pension, which is ex post because it happens after you, mm -hmm. you reach old age. And here I think what could have been done uh, better and maybe can be developed further in the future is thinking about the initial conditions of the different countries that we're talking about though that and and for me it's even more important because looking at, to use this across the world I have to really think of a huge variation in initial conditions the first one is related to the choice of a universal social pension so you you want to pay this to every citizen above a certain age and of course by doing that for a fixed budget envelope you're going to be able to pay less to everyone so if you if you want to pay more to to raise people to to a certain poverty line with the same budget you're going to have to target it and if you target it you have these trade-offs that you're you talk about particularly in terms of the labor market incentives that you're trying to avoid um, but that type of disincentive to be in the formal sector is very different in a middle-income country with middle income rates of coverage of 40, 60, a Colombia, for example, 
uh, versus uh, a low-income country, what I call these the 90-10 countries, where you have uh, very low coverage, so that the, 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 the possibilities of moving in and out of the formal sector at the margin are, are much, much reduced. Um, so this is one example of, of an initial condition difference that would lead me to think about the trade-offs differently in terms of the labor market incentive issues vis-a-vis -vis the contributory scheme. Another trade-off that we need to look at, I think, is the opportunity cost of using this money for a social pension versus a, so a social assistance program, which may give you a better poverty, a bigger poverty impact than if you, you pay it uh, to, to everyone above a certain age. Um, and many of the countries in the region obviously have uh, these social assistance programs, which um, some of them are in the process of expanding. And if you're working within a constrained budget environment, you're making a, a difficult choice between those type of programs. Um, then I, I, I have a question about the, and maybe you can respond to this, uh, on the the assumption that you can price index these social pensions, which already start at a very low level, much lower, by the way, than already exist, as you know, and, and you have written about in many of the countries. Mm -hmm. So in some countries, they'd actually have to reduce uh, the, the existing social pension significantly, but then move it to a universal, like a Venezuela, if you've got 40% of the people receiving a, a much higher pension than you're promoting, then you, you'd have to reduce that for those people to sp and then spread it out over the rest. But the, the real question is, is it realistic from your experience, for, for example, with the political economy of these situations and global experience, that you're going to allow over the long run the social pension to fall relative to income per capita so, so much over, a, say, a three-decade period? It just seems to me to be uh, you know, a, a bit uh, uh, unrealistic to, to think that it's going to, to become sustainable by, by simply inflation indexing it away. And let me move to the uh, ex-ante um, uh, interventions that you advocate. <coughs> we do have this, this issue that you're subsidizing formal sector workers. And unlike some other proposals like Santiago Levy's proposal, where you would essentially give everyone uh, this subsidy, including informal sector workers. You're subsidizing at the margin the, the, the formal sector workers. And so this raises the same questions, I think, of opportunity cost. Is this the, the best way, going back to what I was saying about the social pension? Um, and I'll give you another example. Not only is there opportunity cost there, but maybe a more interesting way of using the same resources is to uh, promote uh, expansion of health insurance coverage. Now, here in Latin America and across the world, we're seeing a lot of initiatives to pay the premium uh, on behalf of, let's say, the targeted poor population uh, for the health insurance premium and, and bringing people into the health insurance, which disproportionately affects the elderly in, in particular. Um, so, so, again, this is a question of whether this is the best uh, use of, of that money. Um, and most Latin American countries do have this dualistic uh, health insurance system, uh, which is c causing duplication of costs and, and a lot of inefficiencies. So if one can bring them into a seamless health insurance coverage system, uh, that seems like something worth, worth covering. And I don't think it would be fair to uh, ask you guys to uh, you know, look at all the alternative uses of, this, uh, of the same budget. That's, that's, you know, that's beyond the scope and, and not uh, really a, a reasonable request. But there are a couple of things, namely social assistance and, uh, and health insurance, which we're talking about the same group of people. And, and, and so you're really dealing with the same, I think, uh, budgetary and redistribution resources here. Now, my final comment is on, on the, the, the financing side of it, which uh, you, you really look towards uh, the use of the VAT. And here that my question, my first question is, really, is it going to be enough? And here's where we, we, we come back to the question of ignoring the reforms of the existing systems. A number of those systems are projected to run deficits. So without, it, there's almost an Im implicit assumption that those systems have become reformed and they're now actually fair and now we're building around that. When in fact, 
if they start to generate big deficits, that's going to start to consume some of your uh, you know, incremental VAT tax revenues, as is, I guess, the case in Uruguay very explicitly. Uh, Alvaro uh, can, can talk to that. Um, so it, it sort of ignores this, uh, this, this potential problem in the pension system. So while I won't suggest going and having a debate about DBDC and parametric reforms, that's a whole book, uh, it has been several books, I would ha have emphasized the point that that is a potential drag on the on the overall social protection budget that needs to be dealt with a, a little more firmly. Um, and by the way, so if we were to expand the coverage of the existing system by giving these nice, uh, you know, d making these incentives to get people in the formal sector, and it's an unsustainable system with unsustainable parameters, then you're going to actually increase the liability of the contributory system and have uh, a, a negative effect on sustainability. And then there's the question of uh, the last thing is on the compensation of the of the poor in particular for the increase in, in the VAT tax. And here it would have been nice to, to show a little bit, um, uh, going back to what Alvaro says, order of magnitude on what the cost would be of that kind of compensation uh, through a cash transfer system and, and even looking at what already exists in terms of the cash transfers uh, that could be ramped up a little bit to to compensate uh, people in Mexico, opportunities could be used, for example, um, with a certain uh, amount. So in conclusion, I, I really, you know, I congratulate, I agree with the basic idea and the fact that we're, we have to start looking at the shift away, I think it's a historic shift, away from Bismarckian social insurance and the reliance on payroll tax financing of health insurance and pensions. And really, I think you're all completely right that the only way to get coverage is going to be to use non-contributory and social pensions and to use general revenues to, to finance health insurance for the poor and so on. The only question is what's the best way to do it and how is that going to vary across uh, countries. So congratulations again. I think it's a great start for, for the debate and maybe we can debate it now. <laughs> okay, Mariano, we had uh, several, uh, several comments from... Um, constructive comments from Robert. Let's try to break them down. So why don't you tell us a little bit what are your reactions to this issue of needing to take into account initial conditions, particularly for the exposed, exposed subsidies. And um, yeah, the issue of the subsidies to the formal sector. Do we really need those subsidies to low-income formal sector workers? And then we can talk about the financing and implicit debt. Sure. No, I mean, great comments, and, and uh, we definitely discussed most most of these things um, while we were writing the report. Um, the, I think, I mean, obviously, initial conditions uh, and specific, specificity of the countries is crucial. I mean, we 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 cannot hide that. And the what we try to keep, to do in the book is keep general principles. And and I think what the kind of countries that we have in the region are more the not 50-50, but like 40, 60, 30, 70 countries. Uh, we have a few of the 90, 10, we could talk about maybe Honduras, uh, Guatemala, Paraguay. But, you know, what you want to, what you want is those countries to become the 50-50 countries, no? So I think we have to distinguish between the short run and the, and the medium run and the long run if you want to. So I agree, the, uh, the initial conditions are important. And then there is this issue, which, by the way, we discussed back in uh, the World Bank and in your pensions course, whether we should have universal pensions or more targeted pensions. No? Okay. And here, the, the main concern from our side is that we do observe, and more and more we're getting more evidence, that this targeting system that we design mostly for CCTs and, and other social assistance um, uh, programs is getting heavier and heavier. It's it's getting more and more profitable to, to be on the right side of that targeting system. Um, and we are a bit concerned about that. Um, so that's why, you know, in, in the discussions in the book, I'm, I'm being completely honest, we thought that, you know, we understand that being universal is more expensive. But we, th we think it, it awaits the idea that you know, you're going to put more and more benefits on this targeting system. We're talking about CCTs. You talk about social uh, assistance programs. But then you put in pensions, and probably you'll put also um, health insurance. And we see this in, in, in many countries. Let me just give you an example. Recently, the, the 
uh, Mexican finance minister, Videgaray, said, like, it looks like we are asking for the informal card to give benefits. So he's thinking about, you know, whenever we give away a benefit, we're asking them, well, I will only give you a benefit if you're not formal, or you, you know, are relatively poor. And we totally understand the, the whole redistribution uh, idea, but in a way, I think the region has been very focused on, on these targeting mechanisms, and we don't know whether that's a long-run equilibrium. That's something that we can uh, sustain in the future. And in a way, we wanted to be a little bit provocative, and we said, you know, universal, I think, would be a, a good way to, to follow. If you're really worried about redistribution or about the or the, the taxes that you need to raise to provide this, and you, you can tax it later. You can tax the, the, the 20 reaches 20% and try to recover part of the of that um, of the universal pension through through taxes. So that that was definitely a debate that, that we had, and 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 it was uh, you know the the majority of the be of what the people in the team thought that you know universal was was the way to go at least from from our uh, perspective. I totally agree, and and we are kind of um, torn a little bit about the inflation indexation. We and we have a box in the book that obviously tells us that. You know, non-contributory pensions cannot remain at 2.5 dollars a day when a country grows. I mean, it's it will just not be make any sense that you know a country like let's say the U.S. or, or Spain or whatever has a 2.5 dollar a day social pension. So uh, the the point that we wanted to raise here is that it's not only the level of your pension that is really important. The, how the demographics are going to change in the future is going to the the indexation is is going to be crucial. And, and here we wanted to put several examples, and you have the example of Brazil where they index to the minimum wage, and that's really a concern when the minimum wage is growing over the real GDP per capita. Um, so I agree that probably that's not the long-run equilibrium, the inflation indexation, especially when a country develops and goes from like a low-income country to a middle-income and high-income country. But definitely we need to put a focus on on that rule and on that indexation rule. and. And there's flexibility and, and on yeah, what countries can do. Yeah. Let, let me stop you there just to get some views uh, on this issue of the social pension, universal versus targeted from Alvaro. Alvaro, what are your thoughts about this? And you know, in the case of your country, what do you think would be the right thing to do? Well, <coughs> uh, my country, Uruguay, is uh, pretty special. Well, I guess everybody says that in their own country is <laughs> special, but. Uh, it's not in the in the median of the of the region, of course, um, and at least uh, in two aspects. First, uh, coverage is already pretty high. You're right. At least coverage knowledge uh, is pretty high. So the, the problem of coverage is much lower here than in other countries uh, in the region. The second peculiarity is that uh, we have an, an aged population. No? So uh, in our country, this proposal is relatively more expensive than in our country. Uh, something that uh, the report uh, mentions explicitly, um, is right, it's correct, it's log logical. OK. So um, it, it's probably not the best case uh, to analyze the, the strengths of the, the appealing of this of this proposal. Uh, in terms also of um, labor market distortions, I was looking at the figures. Nowadays, we do have a non contributory pension uh, that is granted over 70 years old, and it is means tested. Okay? But in practice, uh, there is no such There is no testing, basically. The, the only testing that uh, I know the administration performs is just, is just to check that the individual is not receiving a contributory pension from the, uh, the same system, but no more of that. Um, and very few people are receiving this uh, non-contributory pension. Most people are receiving contributory pensions. Uh, so um, it's not very important nowadays. Um, also because of that, I don't think that uh, in terms of labor market distortions is uh, a pressing issue, a big issue in Uruguay today. Uh, and uh, of course, it would be pretty difficult in our case to introduce a universal social pension 
uh, it would be expensive, it would mean reducing current level because as, as Robert mentioned, uh, the current level of the social pension is much higher than what we propose. Uh, and it wouldn't help much. Uh, as I said, because we already have high coverage, uh, few people are receiving this uh, non contributive pension. But uh, it's a bit unfair to uh, assess the proposal based on a country that is completely out of the, of the line. This, this, this proposal is just not uh, prepared specifically for a country like, like mine, I think. Uh, so I, I, when I said that I think the proposal is, is basically correct, the idea of social pensions, emphasizing uh, low coverage, etc., I was thinking about the region as a whole, not specifically about my country. In my country, we do have some pressing issues. Uh, the fact, for instance, I mentioned very briefly that uh, we, we tend to delay some parametric reforms, uh, which are really necessary, is uh, I think more important now because uh, if we don't do that in, uh, in the near future, we will not be able to discuss about social pension or, or anything like that. We will be again running behind the sustainability issue, and then it would be much, much harder. So in a sense, uh, the type of issues we have are more similar to the things we see in the discussions in, in Europe, for instance, than in uh, other countries uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. okay. David, can I provoke there? Please, please. OK, so <laughs> I think that is uh, an interesting comparison that some of the European countries, for example, which started to run deficits in the contributory schemes and then started to do things like uh, earmark a VAT. And I'm just wondering how different things really are from what we're, if we just change the labels around. So let's take in Uruguay. Uh, I don't know the parameters, but I know that the payroll taxes are quite high already and that at some point there, there was a concern about uh, you know, financing the, the benefits with just the payroll taxes, so you earmarked a VAT. Uh, I forget how many percentage points, right Alvaro? So, uh, yeah, yeah we, we have uh, some financing with value-added tax and... Uh, Is it seven percentage seven points? Seven points of value of tax devoted to that. Right. Uh, I, I don't have now, up on top of my mind, uh, the, how much this represents in terms of total funding of the system, but it, it is traditionally an important part. So, and let's, so let's say that I, I just t I took that fact and then I relabeled uh, some of the things. If the system w had to function purely on payroll taxes, maybe your payroll tax would have to be five percentage points higher than it is. But because you have an earmark VAT, it, it, you had, didn't have to balance it with the payroll tax. So if I just relabel part of the benefit of the, the contributory scheme as a social pension and finance it from the VAT, and then the rest, uh, whatever portion that happens to cover, and then the rest over and above that is financed from the, the payroll tax, then a, a, essentially I've got the same thing. I've increased general revenue financing. The only thing I haven't done is, is labeled uh, what part of the pension is being financed by which part, which tax. I've just thrown it all into one pot and say, okay, I'm doing redistribution with my minimum pension and I'm doing consumption smoothing with uh, an earnings-related pension. But if effectively, what's happening in Europe, it, when, when you get to that stage, you stop raising the payroll tax and you start using general revenue finances mm. so that you can c maintain both pieces. Right. But it's, it's, it's a less transparent kind of way of, of doing it, is my reason. I agree with that, and we're going to go back um, to the issue of financing. We're running out of time here. I wanted to to ask you, Mariano, to tell us a little bit about these subsidies mm -hmm. to the informal sector. Do we really need them? I understand that the idea is to you know, promote incentives for formal employment. Mm -hmm. Here, I mean, here the general point that we wanted to make uh, is that we obviously we need more formal jobs, and now I think if we agree on that, uh, which I think. We, we do, um, then we have, what are the tools that we need? Well, what set of instruments we have on the table? And obviously one of them is prices, no? Prices is some kind of formal subsidies or a decrease in the cost of formality through different mechanisms. I mean, you can reduce um, firing costs, you can reduce minimum wages, you can you can do other things, and you can do subsidies. Now, one of the things that um, 
uh, Robert was was saying about this opportunity cost. Now, is that is that where we can put our money? Is that the best way, the the best place to put our money? That I think we have to be humble, and we don't know. I mean, we don't really know, you know, what is the most effective um, place where we can put our money. What I would say on that is that uh, these, uh, from all the studies that we have. Formal jobs enhance productivity, and that's one of the things that the region is is doing really badly. And in a way, by you know, I'm 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 playing dirty here because I'm putting money in a place where I'm doing both things, in a way increasing the pension coverage and at the same time trying to promote other things. Maybe it's not we're using one instrument for for two things, but definitely I think is is worth a, is worth a shot. And I would say that countries are already doing it. Right. Brazil is already playing substantially with with massive subsidies in, in different sectors um, for mi micro entrepreneurs from strategic right. sectors. Uh, per Peru is, is subsidizing. So if, if it's not the right policy, we, we should know about it and we should push our research agenda about it. And and that's also what this book tries to do. Is like you know we don't have that much evidence on how many formal formal jobs we get from. One percentage point decrease in in the cost. So, um, one question on that, Mariano, just sure. from my side. So, I fully, I personally, I think everybody actually agrees with with the objective that it's important to try to promote formality and try to reduce basically the cost exactly. of formality. And there are different ways to do that. Forget all health insurance. Let's let's imagine that the only program we have here is social insurance is pensions, right? And I understand the need to try to find, identify certain employers who right now cannot afford, for different reasons, the, the payroll tax, low productivity firms, and that something needs to be done to help them pay that tax. But that, would be, that, that from me, separated from giving a subsidy to a formal sector worker to give him a minimum level of benefits. That we're trying to address now with the redistributive function of the pension system. So we make sure that everybody has a minimum. And hopefully that is not financed by a payroll tax. Now, whichever payroll tax remains there to finance consumption smoothing, if you're going to reduce it, then you need to reduce it. Why why you reduce it for based on the worker and not on the employer? Because if you do it on the employer, then you can see what happens with the workers attached to these firms, and you might have some other means to compensate for that. If you do, since they have already the, the social pension or the basic benefit. Why just a random benefit in the middle of the income distribution that basically benefits high in, high productivity, low productivity employers? Sure, only low productivity workers. Long question. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, it, I understand what you're saying, but the who is going to benefit from that subsidy will totally depend on labor and supply elasticity. I mean, you may try to give the subsidy to the workers, and then depending on the sector, the firm will completely appropriate that that subsidy. So uh, yes, in that sense. We need, if we think in a world where you know workers and firms negotiate, and you know part of the subsidy goes to um, each of the uh, of the players here, then you know both will benefit, and that's how you would create more formal jobs. Uh, but again, I mean, here uh, I'm, I'm being humble in the sense that we definitely need to learn more about how costs affect affect firms or or affect the the creation of formal jobs. Maybe. The best way is not subsidizing; is maybe just uh, reducing foreign costs, and and that's that's the research agenda that we want to promote. Learn how these different things that impact the labor market generate more uh, more formal jobs. I understand that the controversy between you know subsidizing relatively high income workers could you know generate some some controversy, but in a way it's it's on the table, and and definitely countries are doing it and. I'm doing it in like large scale. I mean, last last week I was in Brazil, and uh, I didn't know about this program, but they basically reduce social security contributions 20 percent, 20 points of, of wages for strategic sectors that amount to 20 percent, 25 percent of the labor force, formal yeah, labor force that, in Brazil. That's yep, massive. That also means it's a good policy. But that's good. that's massive, and we don't know anything about the effect of that policy. Uh, oh. So in a way. You know, some of the things in the book we are not 100 percent sure, and we need to do more research. But uh, this is something that the countries are definitely pushing for. Right. Any more comments on this topic from Alvaro, Robert, or we move to the next uh, the next question? No, well, uh, just a quick one, David. That uh, I, th I know what your position is on this. I, we've talked about it, and I think you're trying to target 
those firms that where the marginal effect of the reduction is going to be biggest, which is admirable. I don't know the Brazilian uh, story that you're talking about, Mariano, but I would be my concern would be that the choice of strategic sector and the choice of who gets subsidized isn't set in an objective way right. and in a technocratic way. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's it's politicized at some point. Yeah. But again, my comment was a little bit beyond that. Sorry to to make, to go back to this. That it's important to separate the two the two subsidies and have different instruments for the two mm -hmm. subsidies. What is to mm -hmm. subsidize benefits mm -hmm. for workers? They might not be able to contribute. You part of it is subsidized. From what is to subsidize employers because they cannot afford the payroll tax. And I'm just saying that you know going forward, it, it would be important to keep these two elements. Of the policy design, okay. design system. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, David, and, and I think in, in, in two, three years' time, with the number of experiments that the region is undertaking, we'll have a little bit more information on on what really happens when you generate these subsidies, and uh, and we look forward to, to those studies. Let me go to the the last um, the last question that that I have. Time constraints. It's about this point that Robert made that many of these programs already in Latin America have unfunded liabilities, mm -hmm. right? Basically, even if you take into account pay-as-you-go assets the contributions, they are not enough to, pay to, to finance the pension promises that have been made. It's a nice thing now to stop the accumulation of these liabilities and try, and try to have formulas that are actually fair, right? Financial, financially sustainable. What do we do with the tax overhang? What do we do with the debt that is out there now, if you don't default? Mm. A question for the three of you. <laughs> let, me, let me just start by saying that, yes, uh, that's definitely uh, uh, an, an essential comment, especially when you talk about coverage. And, and we have this comment from, um, from Robert when we were writing the book, and, and it's, we managed to put, uh, to put it in the book and, and a box. Maybe if being provocative from some of these Latin American countries, low coverage was actually a good thing from right. a fiscal point of view. <laughs> you know, that the systems didn't cover that many people where it was good because it was so unbalanced. And and by increasing coverage, we're definitely uh, going to have some problems in those systems where, um, where we don't have, we have immense contingent liabilities and they're unbalanced. And, and we, didn't, we didn't get too much in the book about this because essentially I think the debate there is it's pretty clear. I mean, there's not that many ways that you can reduce that. No, you you you, do, you keep lower pensions, you keep pensions later, or you tax more. No, the only thing that we say there is that in a in a region like Latin America, taxing more probably is not a good idea for all the things that we have been talking about in terms of job formal job creation. And then countries will have to make very tough choices uh, because the demographic transition is is hitting and it's going to hit hard. Um, and countries like, like Uruguay, Albert was saying, like Brazil, you know, they have systems. As I said, that, that last week I was in Brazil, the average retirement is 54. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the spending like, you know, Greece or, or, or Italy when they have a population that is four, four times younger. They, they'll have to make parametric reforms. How the political economy of those reforms, as you, Robert, well know, and it's, it's, it's crazy. So. How from the um, our arena, from the international institutions, can somehow facilitate that those reforms over the next ten years is going to be crucial, um, I think, for for the region. Thank you, thank you, Mariano. <laughs> Alvaro, any comments on the implicit debt? The well, uh, of course, in terms of implicit debt, uh, we are the champions in the region, so uh, <laughs> it's of course a concern for us. Uh, well, it's uh, an aged population, so our implicit debt nowadays is estimated in about two to three years of GDP, so it's, uh, it's pretty big. Um, but I, I want to, to comment on something you briefly ma mentioned here, and it is about uh, actuarial fairness in the system. And, and I connect it somehow to this issue of sustainability, implicit debt, and, and all these things. Uh, because, in fact, uh, I don't see very much in the report in terms of actual fairness of the contributory pillar. Uh, correct me if I, I am wrong. Maybe uh, I didn't read it in with sufficient 
uh, detail, I don't know, but uh, this is one, precisely, precisely is one of the points I think uh, we should discuss. I like the idea in the report of separating very neatly uh, between uh, 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 poverty, fighting poverty in old age, and uh, consumption smoothing. Uh, I think it's uh, organized as it's saying. Uh, and when you go to this second part of consumption smoothing, I basically uh, I'm, I am basically inclined to something more uh, actually fair than what we usually see nowadays in the region. Uh, and uh, I don't see much of that uh, in, the, in the report. And this, that, that is, in, in a sense, what I, I was trying to say at the beginning about uh, relativity issues in this, uh, in this report. And when you, your main proposal in terms of the contributory program is subsidizing contributions, uh, I'm really, I'm not totally sure whether I, I agree on that um, this is the main issue. In fact, also a question, uh, a question for you, Mariano. Uh, subsidizing contribution is basically reducing uh, the tax rate, the, the payroll tax. Okay, so uh, in practice, uh, that will basically mean, well, reduce uh, social security contributions, uh, finance part of that uh, out of general taxes, and that's basically the same. Uh, I'm right, I am understanding correctly your proposal. If that is so, uh, we might have a problem in terms of redistribution in the in these countries in which uh, coverage is very low, because uh, basically who are covered are the better off, uh, we or no. Uh, so usually these type of things are, are, are not correct. Gentlemen, I just received a message. Sorry. Just to emphasize uh, um, uh, fairness, actual fairness for uh, the consensus smoothing objective for the contributory uh, pillar, let's say, and uh, focus uh, in terms of fighting poverty for all that which is a risk Okay. That's Sorry, I just received a message. We have five minutes left. So, Robert, any final comments? No, I just I was very happy to hear Avaro's uh, comment there. I, I think it, it is crucial that uh, you know we don't ignore the existing um, system and its parameters when we start to think about you know expanding the coverage of of an unsustainable system. And it's, it goes back to the initial condition question again. You know, and in Uruguay, as I said, if I just relabel things, I can actually make it into a into a clean piece that is redistributive, financed from general revenues, and a, and, a, and, a, and a piece that's financed, maybe not in an actually fair manner, but a piece that's financed for consumption smoothing uh, from payroll taxes. But let me give the rest of the time to Mariano. OK, Mariano, please. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is a, it would have been a different book if we got into the issues of actual fairness. And, and in a way, uh, that is kind of you know, the, the issues that the countries will have to address uh, in terms of how we're going to how we're going to address that because definitely some of the systems in the region will not be sustainable and increasing coverage uh, we, we mentioned that the way increasing coverage will increase the debt and then the contingent liabilities that that will impose and I'm my, glad you put my, that in by the way Mariano eh? I'm glad you put that in and that was your comment and, and point <laughs> taken uh, and it's true it's true there's it's nothing uh, we can do about it but when you think about the report, I mean, it, that was definitely an issue, but it, it wasn't the the main thing that we wanted to convey to the mm. to the public. But definitely, that's something that has to be in the labor uh, in the pension reform agenda in, in the future. It cannot be avoided with the with the demographic change. Um, I will just say that again, going back to the to the subsidies, among all the different measures, I think uh, both. Um, the World Bank and other people were exactly on the on the taxes, but let's go back a, a step on the on the subsidies. Sorry, let's go back a, a step. We want to increase formal formal jobs, and for that there's a there's a number of tools. Some of them will be definitely more cost effective than just subsidies, and those those areas we need to definitely explore more. It's just that we know very little, and they're very difficult to quantify and and to put in a report. But uh, in a sense, we have a, a, a several tools that we can use among them subsidies, and we definitely have to 
understand better the way they, they work. The fact that they could be regressive uh, in principle in the short run, yes, we agree. Formal workers are normally high income workers, but we hope that with these subsidies you will bring more people into the formal sector, more low income people, and in the long run you could produce some of that regressivity. So let, let me just say, to try to summarize, it's very difficult to summarize the discussion, but a couple of messages for the audience so they remember. First of all, a great contribution, and uh, I like very much the fact that the book makes it clear pension systems can affect the labor market, and those effects need to be taken into account when we discuss about possible reforms. That's very good. This idea of separating what is the poverty prevention function from the consumption is moving function. We need to have redistribution, and it should be explicit, transparent. Try not to finance this through general revenues. That will help you with distortions in the labor markets. I think we all recognize the importance of eventually converging to formulas that are actually fair, financially sustainable, meaning linking contribution to benefits. Whether it's DB, DC, pay as well funded, I think that's a secondary issue, but we need to think about how to finance the implicit debts that most countries already have. And this point that was made by Robert, right, pay attention to initial conditions. I think there are two issues, at least, the fiscal space and the size of the formal sector that will definitely influence how a given system is uh, reformed. And we need to keep talking and debating about the best ways to reduce the cost of formal, formal employment, basically. So thank you very much to all of you. I really enjoyed the discussion. and. Uh, all the best. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.